So today we're going to be looking at the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. So this morning in the in the in Shiloh, Rhoda brought an awesome uh, word around the table of the Lord about just in the context of how in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six it says that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we proclaim the death of the Lord till he comes. So even at the Lord's table, there is a continued proclamation of the coming of the Lord. And the, the Lord's table is even one area of which by which God prepares us for the coming. Every time we partake of the Lord's table, we are one partaking of the Lord's table closer to the coming of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And so uh, there's a wonderful proclamation that goes out every time we are eating in, of the bread and drinking of the cup that the Lord is coming. And then, and then I shared later on in the meeting uh, about the coming of the Lord and how God wants us to remain in everything we're doing to remain in view of the coming of the Lord, that we are being prepared for something wonderful, and it's it's the coming of the Lord. And Rhoda shared, she was sharing this morning, that the, the greatest, most awesome event to take place is what we're getting ready for, and there's meant to be an anticipation and excitement growing in our hearts for the coming of the Lord, not a fear-motivated Jesus is going to come and sort it all out attitude. And, uh, wow, things are getting so bad we need Jesus to come. No, no, no. And excitement that the bride is getting ready for the coming of her bridegroom. Hallelujah. And excitement that the sons of God are preparing the earth for, the, for, the, for Jesus to come. Hallelujah. And so God is wanting to uh, help us have the right, if you like, have the right expectation of the coming. Because I don't know, you you probably all do, but I meet people who are Christians who I don't, just who I don't know very well, and very often they'll say, "Oh, look at how everything's going. The Jesus is coming soon," and, and and I can't get on I can't get on the same boat as that one. Yes, I do agree, Jesus is coming soon, but not because of that. <laughs> Amen. I'm not looking at the same reasons they're looking at, because many Christians come out of this area of Jesus is going to come and sort it all out instead of, no, where to be walking in victory for Jesus to come. Amen. There's a victorious church. So anyway, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just to get this word, uh, the word parousia, the word for the coming. <clears throat> I'm going to read it, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 23. But the word coming is in the verse 20 in verse 23, but I just want to read it from verse 20. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Now that word first fruits is just an important word. The Apostle Paul is obviously coming from that uh, knowledge of the Old Testament background that uh, in Leviticus chapter 23, you can read about the day of first fruits. It's part of the greater feast of Passover. And uh, the day of first fruits was the last aspect, if you like, of that feast of Passover. And that day of first fruits, Christ fulfilled by becoming the first fruits to rise from the dead. Hallelujah. Jesus died. He was buried. And then on, on the day after the Sabbath, which was the day of first fruits, on the day after the Sabbath, he rose from the dead. He's the first fruits of them who have fallen asleep. Verse 21, for since by man came death, that was through Adam, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. That's Christ. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and he's already been made alive. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. Hallelujah. So we already learned one awesome thing about the coming. What's going to happen at the coming? What's going to happen at the coming? There's going to be a resurrection. 
there's going to be a resurrection at the coming of the Lord. And it's going to be those who are Christ at his coming. And so this is an awesome thing for us to be expecting for, amen, and probably is not talked about enough in, uh, in, in, our, in our fellowship and Christian circles generally, that we are the hope of the gospel is that at the coming of the Lord, there's a resurrection. Hallelujah. There's a bodily change. And it's also wonderful to realize God didn't just save our spirits, but God redeemed us completely. Amen. God purchased through the blood of Jesus. He has purchased our whole being, spirit, soul, and body. And so that final aspect, uh, that final installment of the inheritance is the redemption of our bodies, it says in Romans 8, verse 23, that the adoption, the final aspect of that adoption is the redemption of our bodies so that this mortal puts on immortality, this corruptible puts on incorruption. And that happens at the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. So let's look forward to the coming. Let's be excited for the coming, amen, because that's when a great change takes place. It happens in the twinkling of an eye, it says later on in 1 Corinthians 15. But just before we go on any further than that, this word coming, very important. And in my um, spiritual life Bible, there's a word wealth for the word coming here. It's the Greek word parousia. It's a noun. And it's not related to the verb in Greek to come. Because the coming is an it's it's an event, it's a it's a noun, it's a it's something that happens. Okay. And it's the coming. It's got a definite article in it, even in front of it, the coming. And it, it says here that the word parousia is the technical term signifying the second advent. Advent is another word for a coming or an arrival. And so it's the technical term signifying the second advent of Jesus. And it was never used to describe his first coming. That's really important. You know, when Christ came into the world, conceived and then born of the Virgin Mary, that, that particular coming when he appeared in the flesh, when God appeared in the flesh, was not the parousia and was not a parousia. That word parousia is never used to describe that particular appearance of God coming in the flesh. That's, that's, that's interesting because, you know, among Christian circles, we always talk about the second coming. But biblically speaking, there is no second coming. There's just the parousia, and that's still to happen. Amen. He will, the only time it's used about second, talking about the word second in the, um, in the New Testament, is that he will appear a second time. And it says that in Hebrews, that he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. But the word parousia, there's never a second parousia. There's only the parousia. And once the parousia has happened, it's happened. Hallelujah. And so then it says this about the meaning of the word. Parousia originally was the official term for a visit by a person of high rank, especially a king. So it's the visiting or the arrival of a king or a person of high rank. That's how it was used, even in the Roman context that this word was used in. It was an arrival that included a permanent presence from that coming onward, and that's very important because with the parousia, there was never a coming and a going. It was an arrival that included a permanent presence from that time onward. The king had arrived. Hallelujah. And so the glorified Messiah's arrival will be followed by a permanent residence with his glorified people. The king has come. Hallelujah. And so the parousia is an awesome event, if you like, because it was the arrival of the king with a permanent presence and a permanent residence among his people. Wow. So this is what the meaning of the word is. So it's powerful. This is, so there's no room for Jesus to come, go. He's coming. Amen. So now I want I want you to go to 2 Peter chapter 1 to see something very awesome about the coming, okay? 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 to 18. 2 Peter chapter 1 
verse 16 to 18. This is the Apostle Peter talking. He said, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's Peter saying here? We didn't, we didn't concoct or make up a whole bunch of very well-planned stories here. We didn't come up with fables. We, we weren't trying to devise some sort of, you know, cool idea here when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he says to him, to the people, he says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What's, the, what's Apostle Peter saying? We weren't making nothing up. We weren't just coming up with stories. We saw it. We saw the power and coming of the Lord. We even experienced the coming, the parousia of the Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it. We, we partook of it. When did that happen? Well, let's keep reading verse 17. For he, Jesus, received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Verse 18, and we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Aha. Uh -huh. When did Peter experience and see the coming of the Lord? When he was on the holy mountain and heard the voice coming from the excellent glory saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When was that? We call it the Mount of Transfiguration. Let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. Actually, we're going to go to Matthew 16, verse 28, to pick it up where it actually begins. Hallelujah. So we're learning about the coming. And this, this little bit of 2 Peter chapter 1 and then Matthew 17, this blows out uh, many ideas of the coming. Because this brings the coming into an eternal reality that can be experienced today. Hallelujah. And will finally manifest all over the earth. So in Matthew chapter 16, verse 28, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Notice Jesus' language here. Now, this is not the word parousia, by the way. This is just the verb to come. In this verse, but Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So Jesus was saying this to his disciples, he was saying this to the apostles he was raising, and he was telling them that some of them would not taste death until they had seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's a good description of the parousia of the Lord. It's the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Matthew 17, verse 1. Now after six days. So do you see in the, in the Bible, the people who, like Matthew, who wrote his gospel, he did not separate his, his gospel up into chapters and, and verses. That came later. And so the chapter breaks in the Bible uh, the at the discretion of the person who was doing the job of of breaking it up, and sometimes they get it in interesting places, because for us it makes us think that there's a break and now something new is starting, but here it's not something new at all. Jesus just said, "Some of you who are with me here will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom." Now, after six days, in other words, this is the flow on. And saying, now after six days, what Jesus said is about to be fulfilled. Amen. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So the sum of them who would not taste death until they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom was three out of those disciples. It was Peter, James, and John. And he led them up on a high mountain. Verse 2. And he was, Jesus was, transfigured before them this word transfigured is the greek word metamorpho and it means to be changed transformed into a whole new substance okay metamorpho 
we, we say in English, metamorphosis. And that's like the caterpillar to the butterfly transformation. That's the from one substance to another. And so this, this is what happened. Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with Jesus, talking with, Jesus, talking with him. Verse 5, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So that's what Peter was referring to was this experience when he said, we did not tell you, we did not divide, we did not tell you cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses. We saw the coming. And so Peter is referring back to this. When they saw Jesus transfigured before them in all of his glory, Peter says, we saw the coming. We were eyewitnesses of the coming. That was the parousia. We were eyewitnesses of the parousia. And so this, this, this breaks the parousia out of, a, um, out, of this, out of this area where it's totally focused on a chronological time frame to actually realize that the parousia is an eternal reality that can be accessed now, even before it, it fully manifests, if you like, because Peter, James, and John accessed it. They experienced it. They had a taste of it. They saw it by being led up that mountain with Jesus. And so we could say that the veil for Peter, James, and John for a little moment the veil was removed and they saw the coming. Hallelujah. And what did the coming look like? It looked like Jesus in all of his glory being manifested. It looked like seeing Jesus beyond the veil. You know, Jesus was, a, he looked like a man and he was a man in one sense. Many people who saw him during that time they just saw a man. They, they, didn't see, they just saw an ordinary man. Many of them did not see the glory. They didn't see the Son of God. They just saw a man named Jesus, uh, as the son of a carpenter and the son of Mary, and they didn't see anything more than that. But Peter, James, and John that day, they saw beyond the veil of the flesh of Jesus, and they saw Jesus in all of his glory. They saw his face shining like the sun. They saw the glory emanating out of Jesus. It, the veil was removed. And Peter said that was the coming. We saw the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not making up stories. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it. Hallelujah. And you know what? God wants you to see it. He wants you to push in to see the coming. Amen. And finally, this coming is going to manifest all over the earth. Amen. In that day when he comes. Hallelujah. And when he comes, there's going to be a resurrection. Everything's going to change. That glory that is emanating out of Jesus will actually be manifested all over the earth. And there won't be anything able to stand that is not of him and that is not believing in him. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. So this gives us a good expectation for the coming of the Lord, what to expect. Amen. Isn't it interesting that the cloud even appeared there, that a bright cloud overshadowed him, and, 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 that, and out of that cloud came the voice? And, um, and what, so what does it say in Acts chapter 1? Let's have a look there. You, you, most of you will know it, but let's read it. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 says, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Hallelujah. He was received up in a cloud and he's going to come with a cloud 
And when, when Peter, James, and John saw the power and coming of the Lord, there was a bright cloud that overshadowed Jesus. And there was a voice that said, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Hallelujah. Are you getting something? See, the coming, we're to be caught up in that coming, brethren. Woo! We're to be caught up in the glory of that coming. We're to be changed in the coming. In the twinkling of an eye, let's have a look in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's just have a look here just to see, just to follow the theme too, that at the coming there will be a resurrection. Let's have a look in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Amen. Verse 50 to uh, 55. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 to 55. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery, a hidden truth, a secret. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, we're not all going to die. There's going to be a generation that won't actually taste death, that won't actually die. There's going to be a generation on the earth that will be alive at the coming of the Lord. But And so the mystery is we're not all going to sleep. We won't all die, but we all shall be changed. So whether you are dead or alive, you're going to change. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the one thing that is going to happen to everybody is we'll be changed, to every believer. Now, if you're a dead believer, you're dead in Christ, you're going you're gonna to rise from the dead with an incorruptible body. If you're a believer who's alive at the coming, you're going to be changed. And so whether you're alive or dead at the coming of the Lord, the one thing that's going to happen to all of us is we're going to be changed. We're going to be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. Hallelujah. It says that in a moment. And that word moment is the Greek word atomos. It's like in an atomic moment, in an indivisibly small moment, a moment that you can't break up into thousands or, or hundreds of thousands or millions or billions. You can't split it up. It's an atomic moment, such a small moment that you can't divide it. Now, we, it, you can't even imagine that. But that's, that's what Paul is trying to say. It's such a, it's just a moment. Just bam, it's happened. And I don't know about you, but when I got born again, that's how it happened for me. One moment, I was not born again. The next atomos, the next moment, man, I'm born again. Everything's changed. Everything's different. The, the flowers are more beautiful. The sunsets are brighter. The, 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 just the trees are awesome. Wow, everything's different. I'm changed in the twinkling of an eye in a moment. And, G and, and the Apostle Paul is saying that we're going to change at the coming of the Lord, that there's, there's a change that will happen just like that. Bam, it's happened. And what's going to happen? Well, it says in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Just like that. At the sound of that last trumpet, it says for the for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Hallelujah. Because it says back in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And that happens at the coming of the Lord, that death is finally destroyed forever in manifestation. When Jesus died and rose again, in that sense, he's destroyed death already. But at the coming of the Lord, will be the manifestation fully of that destruction of death. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more, no more need for Marcus to heal anybody. Hallelujah. Because at that time, there, there will be no more sickness anymore. It won't exist. It's been totally destroyed. Hallelujah. 
Oh, what a what an awesome expectation. Let's have a look at Philippians chapter 3. Just following this theme of, of what's happening at the coming of the Lord. So we can be continually prepared, amen, for the coming of the Lord. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, or our conversation, our way of life is in heaven. Our The affairs of our life are in heaven. It could also be translated from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're waiting for the Saviour to manifest or to appear out of heaven. And what's he going to do when he does that? He will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So when Jesus is revealed from heaven, he will transform our lowly body and conform it to his glorious body. So here we see that the incorruptible, immortal body that we receive will actually be just like the body of Jesus now, his glorious body. Hallelujah. That's beautiful. Okay. Now I want you to go to... I'm going to just show you a couple other verses first, and then I want to get to the, the crux verse. 1 Thessalonians. Let's go to chapter 5. Well, actually, no. Let's first go to 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you? He's talking to the Thessalonians here. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his parousia, at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Wow. So Paul the Apostle here says that what, what is our hope? What is our joy or what is our crown of rejoicing? It's you Thessalonians, the, one we've the ones we've ministered to, the ones we've shared the word of God with, the ones that we've ministered to by the spirit of the living God to bring up to maturity as sons of God. You, is it not even you? You are our hope. You are our joy. You are our crown of rejoicing in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. You are our glory and joy. And so it is the minister's joy and hope that all of all the ones that they've ministered to will be able to stand in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. That when Christ, our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. Hallelujah. That we all are there appearing with him in the glory because we're already there in the glory. And so when he manifests, we're seen for where we are in him, in the glory. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. <clears throat> now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is preparing us for his coming. And he, he wants our whole spirit, soul, and body to be preserved blameless. You know, the whole entirety of who we are. Now, what does it mean that our whole spirit and soul and body will be preserved blameless? Well, it may, blameless doesn't mean, by the way, that it, it doesn't sometimes mean what we would think. Sometimes we can think blameless means like uh, perfect in the sense of a perfectionist person being perfect. You know, who, this person who never does anything wrong. No, it's not like that. Blameless just means that whatever you have done wrong has been dealt with. It's It's been forgiven and it's under the blood and it's been made right. That you can't be blamed anymore. Amen. And if you have confessed your sins, Christ is faithful and just to forgive, you, forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness so that there's nothing by which the devil can accuse you anymore. And so you're blameless. And so God wants us all preserved, blameless, nothing outstanding. Amen. 
that, that everything we know of is is everything we're consciously aware of, of and, and everything that's in our conscience is clear. And that even our bodies are preserved blameless means that and we're using our bodies for the gospel. Our bodies are sanctified, set apart for use by God, that, that we're not using our bodies to sin. We're not using our bodies for sexual immorality. We're not using our bodies to do the wrong thing, to walk into the pub and get drunk. We're using our bodies instead for the glory of the Lord. We're, we're offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable act of worship to the Lord in view of his mercy. Amen. And so that's our body that's preserved blameless at the coming and will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And so final aspect for today, there's so much to share about the coming. I'd love to get into someday the parables of Jesus to prepare us for the coming. We think about, you know, treating the, the brethren of Jesus, making sure we clothe them, we, we feed the brethren of Jesus, not just physically, this is talking about too, by the way, but and the brethren are not just, we're not talking about the Jews. We're talking about those who are believers, those who love Jesus. They're the brethren. Amen. And so we look after the brethren and we visit them in prison. Amen. Not only the physical prisons, but we visit them in the, in the prison houses of their life to help them get set free. Amen. We feed them the word of God. We give them the drink of the spirit of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So we go around and, and that's what we're doing apostolically we go around the nations to bring the church up to maturity to visit them even in their sickness and to bring them up hallelujah to prepare them for the coming we got to be like those five wise virgins amen to be prepared for the coming of the bridegroom but the final thing i want to show you is in 1 thessalonians chapter 4 and obviously i'm not going to do this full service because i'm going to do it fairly briefly in the context of what we've just been looking at but Paul the Apostle says to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who've fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So Paul's wanting the brethren in Thessalonica not to be ignorant about the eternal reality of believers who've died. Amen. He doesn't want us sorrowing for believers who've perished, who've died in their bodies. He doesn't want us sorrowing, sorrowing for them like the world because we're different to the world. We have a hope. He says in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Jesus those who sleep in Jesus. So there's a hope that when Jesus comes, he's going to bring with him those who've died in Christ. That's what Paul's saying here. In verse 15, it says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the parousia, until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. So what does the Apostle Paul want us to know? That there's no advantage whether you're alive or dead at the coming of the Lord. It's like some of the Thessalonians were thinking, oh, no, if they've died before the Lord comes, then they're going to miss out on something. And Paul the Apostle is saying, no, whether you're dead or alive at the coming of the Lord, you're not going to miss a thing. Hallelujah. And so for those who've died and for those, those who are alive at the coming of the Lord, the change that's going to take place will not happen to them before those who've died but it's actually going to happen simultaneously as we see. Amen. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Ho! Hallelujah. And God is restoring the shout to his people in this day. Amen. There's a shout arising among his people. Hallelujah. And the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. That's important. He's descending from heaven, and it's with a shout. It's with the voice of an archangel. Don't have time to go into it, but if you read Jude 9 in your own time, Jude verse 9, you'll see that the only, the only, note, the only place I know of in the whole Bible where it records the voice of the archangel, Michael, is when he says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. 
So scripturally, the only time we see the voice of the archangel is when he says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. So I think that sounds pretty good, that at the coming of the Lord, there will be the voice of the archangel. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Hallelujah. That sounds pretty good at the coming, doesn't it? That there's a big rebuke of the devil. Amen. And it says that the Lord will descend from heaven with the trumpet of God. Hallelujah. The trumpet of God. And God's been restoring the shofar in these days. And, uh, and not only that, but the trumpet even is prophetically to the proclamation of the word of God. So it's a bit of both. Amen. That, that physical sound, we love to hear that sound. And who's ever heard the anointed sound of the shofar? It's powerful. But then there's also the, the proclamation of the word. And so what's going to happen when the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God? So remember the trumpet back in 1 Corinthians 15, that when that last trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we who are alive will be changed. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. And so now at the trumpet, when the Lord descends from heaven, he said the dead in Christ will rise first. Whoa, up from the grave they will arise. Verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in what? In the resurrection. Oh, and all these ones who are dead, who died in Christ, they'll be raised first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. Oh, and, and 1 Corinthians 15 says we will be changed. And we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds. Hallelujah. And remember the those two angels, those two angel men spoke to the disciples saying the same way you saw Jesus go up into heaven in that cloud, same way you're going to see him come again. Hallelujah. He's going to come on that cloud. He's going to come with the clouds of heaven. And, you know, do a good study on the cloud in the Bible. It's awesome. Amen. There's that glory cloud that came on Mount Sinai. There, there's, that, there's that cloud that came on the Mount of Transfiguration in the New Testament, hallelujah, and even Hebrews 12 says that there's a great cloud of witnesses, and Jesus is coming with 10,000s of his saints, hallelujah, and so it says that we're caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so Jesus is coming, he's coming in his parousia, he's coming in his arrival, he's coming to bring a permanent presence from that time onwards, and in that coming, we are caught up in that coming. We are caught up in the resurrection. We're being changed. We're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord as he's coming in the air. It's that simple. There's no mention of a U-turn to go up to heaven to spend seven years there. So don't add that. Don't put it in there. Stop it. Just receive the word of God, that we meet him in the air. We meet the Lord in the air, and therefore, and we shall, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so comfort one another with these words. And so, brethren, I encourage you, let's comfort one another with these words and encourage the saints to be looking for expectantly the coming of the Lord in all of its awesome uh, excitement, knowing what is going to take place, knowing the final instalment of our adoption as sons will, will take place at the coming, at the parousia. And so, brethren, comfort one another with these things. Get encouraged in the parousia, that the parousia is a time of all the glory of Jesus being revealed. Amen. His face shining like the sun, clothed in white. It's a glorious, glorious glorious event but it's an eternal reality amen not only as a chronological thing that will sometime take place in the future but it's something you can even access in the eternal realm by faith having that veil removed may the lord jesus be with you as you consider these things amen